Alright, so uh, trichomoniasis, this was the topic that uh, we were supposed to begin and said that we'll start afresh. And uh, my laser is not working, so let's see if I can move around. Again, causative organism is trichomonas vaginalis. And uh, if you remember when we talked about commensals, we talked about vaginal flora. Uh, it remains as one of the important STD or STI, sexually transmitted pathogen. And again, uh, those are going to be both for male and female. But since the uh, anatomically the exposed uh, Epithelial area in women is more than men. So they have more of a problem in terms of uh, having an infection. So you, you normally see infections of vagina, urethra, paraurethral glands, uh, especially in females. Incubation period, how long does it take for this particular uh, parasite to uh, be prepared to cause problems, but can see it's like very varied. Normally, I would say like three to four days or seven to eight days, but you look at four to 28 days. And part of the reason is that we are not sure that how are, how is your immune system going to put up a fight that. So that actually takes us a while. Uh, it is not a reportable illness. It's not a reportable illness. And uh, CDC does see quite a lot of cases uh, annually, so about like five million. But again, uh, who did this as a project? Who did this as a project? Which individual? You did that. Did you say you? Who did that as a individual project? All right. But I would recommend again that since the statistics keep on changing, you look up look look up the uh, latest statistics that we have. Uh, WHO estimates uh, that half of treatable STIs are trichomoniasis. So that's a WHO thing. I know we talked of chlamydia as number one STD in this part of the world. But again, uh, if you look globally, uh, that it does take a big burden on the world population in terms of trichomoniasis. And common slangly, they say tricks. So that when they say trick, they're talking about trichomoniasis. Especially trichomonasis vaginalis. <clears throat> okay. uh, <clears throat> life cycle, and as I told you the other day, how to uh, look at life cycles and the, what does it signify. Again, if you do see as a reiterated both male and female, the chances are uh, that there's an STD. And I would also want you to pay attention to again infection and diagnosis stages and also keep in mind uh, the way this divides like a binary fission in terms of uh, progression but nevertheless it remains as an important uh, STI and uh, both male and females are infected with that now <clears throat> some of the problems that we discussed earlier, especially when we talked of uh, bacterial STIs. And I said that uh, even if they are reportable, people would not turn up to clinics. And the reason was because of them being asymptomatic. Now in this case, again, you will see that if I'm giving you the number, 30% uh, are symptomatic. Right, so these are some of the inherent problems. The incubation time is from 4 to 28 days. So you get infected today, you may see a disease a month later. And uh, most of the time, the presentation, especially in female, is that they have a vaginal discharge. And uh, in this particular case, you can see that if it's a purulent, malodorous, a greenish, yellow, or frothy discharge. Again, 
uh, one of the most complicated cases that we normally see is a vaginal discharge. And uh, again, in this case, as I said, in upper respiratory tract as well, and I said earlier, in terms of mucosal response to infection as well, that uh, odor, pus, and color basically is coming from microorganisms. So that itself will testify. And then again, you can see from uh, those women who have menstrual problems, they, they have spotting and irregular menses and so on and so forth, their clinical situation may be messed up, it will be difficult. But the important thing that brings people, uh, especially women, to the clinic is especially pregnancy, because uh, pregnancy was something that they, they will examine that first trimester, second trimester, and also uh, painful uh, urination, dysuria, or burning during, uh, you know, uh, urination. And uh, why would they have lower abdominal pain? Because many a time it goes and travels up uh, as a pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease. So that again, but you can see all of these things can be ignored. But of course, uh, Pus should not be in uh, kind of ignored. As far as males are concerned, uh, clear of slightly prone discharge, they will have dysuria. Uh, but as I said earlier, 70%, uh, I mean, this is the way, just keep in mind, if I said 30% sym symptomatic, I could have said 70% asymptomatic. So keep that very in your mind in terms of it being a distractor. So those of you who have visual memories. If many a times when we look especially for urethral discharge or vaginal discharge, we prepare a vaginal swap and wet mount. This would we'll call a wet mount. So if it's dry, then everything gets dried out. If you look at the uh, vaginal wet mount, this is what you will see, a motile trichomonas. So they are like motile trichomonas. And this test as done as microscopy is quite sensitive, so you can pick it up like 60% of the time. Uh, you can also culture uh, the sensitivity in terms of us using uh, molecular techniques and genetic techniques uh, are like PCR, which is highly specific, about 100%, and highly sensitive. Of all the tests that I've uh, shown so far or not so far, I doubt if I have told you that any particular test would have 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity, but this happens to be one of the tests for diagnosing trichomonasis that remains so. Uh, diagnosis is more difficult in men because, as I said, they would not have uh, broad symptoms in terms of women because of the exposed epithelial area. But uh, again, uh, in those cases, uh, we can, we should not rely on uh, microscopy. We should go for either a culture or the, uh, the genetic test we call NATS. And we discuss that in detail in syphilis. Uh, treatment wise, uh, as a rule, all infected individuals should be treated regardless of the symptoms. And the classical antimicrobial treatment is metronidazole or tenidazole. I told you, like azole drugs, very common. Like any other problems that we're having in uh, bacteria, and I just want you to, those of you who may have passed micro exam or may have got good score in micro exam without even knowing genetics, you can go back and know genetics is going to haunt you over and over again if you don't understand why are these microorganisms having uh, developed resistance. You see, resistant infections are coming up all, for almost everything. So that's something that you will be quizzed over and over again. To make sure that uh, you understand the concept and uh, may know what are the possible causes. And when such a persistent resistance happens, that we have to kind of treat that in more aggressive way in terms of 
uh, treatment option. Okay, and then again, the rest of the story is pretty much the same. Remember, I don't want to go and teach you again. Uh, in, in this case, you have to treat the partner. If you treat one person, you know, the other person is the reservoir. So all these things always keep in mind when we talk. When I, The moment I say STI, immediately everything should flash back in your mind. That that's what we need to do. Okay. Now, in terms of, uh, finally, helmets that we normally see, uh, there are tons of them, but uh, let's talk of three main types today in terms of those helmets that cause disease. And you guys have nematodes that we commonly see in children, round worms, and cestodes, or flat forms of tapeworm, we see all population type, and uh, trematodes are the flukes that we commonly see. Depends upon your immune response, depends upon um, the population group, that we are studying depends upon the quality of life, quality of uh, food, and so on and so forth. But the highest populations happen to be those people who have recently moved to these places. They may carry the ova and parasites, ONP, as we discussed earlier. But uh, CDC does think that uh, people who recently immigrated from Southeast Asia, Caribbean, Mexico, and Central America have a are happen to be high risk population. Those people who stay in the hospital, institu institutionalized patient, chronic diseases, and so on and so forth, cancer, uh, preschool children, daycare centers, and of course, immunocompromised individuals. So these are like group of high risk population that we do see helminthic disease in there. Uh, let's take entrobiasis. Again, the causative organism is Entrobius vermiculatus. So these are like worms. So you can see that they basically uh, are huge. And you can see in terms of scale, in terms of sizes. Uh, they are also known in layman term as uh, pinworms. And um, anywhere like one centimeter, they are one of the most widely distributed worms all over the world. We do see 42 million cases in the US. There's a lot of population, especially children, tend to be more, uh, you know, kind of being high risk as compared to adults, and again, transmitted by fecal oral. Okay. Uh, life cycle again, entro entrobiasis again. Look at the color scheme, and look at the major part of the intestine where they tend to reside and again they are they're the one intestinal and they can stay and uh, lodge themselves over there many a times especially when the kids children are malnourished and keep on growing uh, these worms in their intestine so they find like a good place to sit over there and develop in millions and then again the cycle continues uh, you can also look at the infectious and diagnostic stage of this particular uh, site. Now, in terms of uh, presentation, normally when you see clinically, uh, children present as an irritation in perianal area, and then uh, when it grows out of proportion, these worms can actually block intestine. And they can even uh, cause infections, and they can even perforate. So they, because they have the mouth, so they're going to go push and perforate babies or children's uh, intestinal. Uh, people uh, especially have sleeping problems, the kids' restlessness, and they have dermatitis and all those problems. And sometimes what we normally do is that uh, it's difficult to, uh, what do you call, diagnose them. And sometimes they put like a tape around the anal canal of the, uh, of the children especially in the night time when the activity gets less, the activity of the worms gets more. So they will kind of, kind of, you know, over there and lay eggs and you can pick it up and study under the microscope. But for uh, children, it happens to be very annoying uh, problem. And the, it, many of they will tell you they, they pass it on in feces. So you see huge worms being passed in feces. You can look, as I said, perianal swab as well. And then again, examination of fingernail scrapings because 
if it's is going to irritate uh, the, their bottom, they're going to scratch it, and they will have it in their fingernails. And wherever they're going to dip their fingernails, water, food, or whatever uh, things in objects in the kitchen, they're going to pass it on to the people as well. So that's where it is coming from. Uh, there are over-the-counter things available, non-pharmacological. Wash everything. Hot water, that's what they suggest. And uh, as far as pharmacological agent, I thought I gave you an assignment, right? We went also. Did anybody do any shopping over there? <laughs> what did I say? Where did you find my vendor Yeah, I said, look, uh, yeah, look at the huge cartons, the big stores, especially for bananas. So say all the vendors all treated, or Thio vendors all treated. And then there are other available as well. <clears throat> We don't want to go in much detail clinically, but I can tell you that sometimes they are so active, uh, worms are so active in intestine that they can climb up from the intestine, go to the stomach, climb up to esophagus, and go into trach and block, uh, they uh, suffocate the babies or the children. So these are kind of weird uh, creatures. Cystisarcosis, uh, again, um, they are there in terms of uh, larva or cysts of the fork take home and the the ancestors they can they have a bit they have a bigger problem especially when you consume as a part of meat especially uh, pork and you can pick it up and then it can infect your muscle brain and other tissues so all these helminths uh, family, uh, this is a little bit scary, especially it reaching the brain. And if it does reach the brain, it would present as, you know, like a seizure. Or something. There's a very high incidence, again, in, uh, in areas of the world where there's poor sanitation. And uh, it is considered, again, a neglected parasitic infection. Because many a time people in those areas, may, they may not have these kind of tight FDA rules and regulations, meat inspection, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at the cysticercosis life cycle from CDC, again, uh, the most important thing, as you can see from here, other than the oral fecal, uh, you will see once they get absorbed from the blood, they the blood can take them to wherever the blood goes. And in this case, you can see that you, the major problem I told you was the brain and the lungs. And they can also go in your sinuses as well. But if you look at their life cycle in terms of being infectious and in terms of uh, being diagnostic, as I said, the most important thing is that that is the meat consumption of pork and it's not been tested, so that's the human cycle between pig and people consuming uh, pork, and then goes back and forth in terms of uh, infecting the lining of the, uh, the intestine and causing problems in terms of development. So you may acquire ova or cyst, and that kind of, because cysts are smaller than the big worm, but you can take cyst in terms of meat and then it will develop into a big uh, worm. And you can see some of them are huge and gigantic. And the other thing uh, is there, if you, you can Google it, and you will see, especially for the head of this worm, tapeworm, it has those like, suction cups. It has suction cups, so it's going to attach to your intestine and very tightly attach. So if you were to kind of pur to purge it out, or when I push it out through, you know, what you call uh, diarrhea or through laxative, it's not, they're not going to go. They're tightly attached over there. And uh, to such an extent that some of them will have even more than one suction cups. So they will even damage intestine as well. And then they have this head, which is going to get attached there, both uh, intestines of both animals. Uh, as I said, the, the worst form of cystic sarcosis is that if it goes and infects 
our muscles, so it can go and infect your muscle. You see it lumps under the skin, but sometimes it gets unnoticed. Uh, if it goes into your brain, cystic so cirrhosis of the brain, you will see again seizures, headaches, confusion, so and so, Dep depending upon which part of the brain these particles have traveled. Okay, and then again, unfortunately, if it's not diagnosed and if it's not properly treated in time, it can lead to death. So this is one of the conditions that consumption of a contaminated uh, meat uh, can cause death of the person. How do you diagnose? Of course, if it is central, if it is there in your brain, you have to do MRI or CAT scan of the brain. You can also look for the blood testing. And then again, you can also inquire uh, people's travel history or social history and you know where the source of that particular meat is coming from. And of course, you can imagine if the big uh, meat companies were to sell a product that FD picks up as a uh, positive agent of that particular cystic cirrhosis, what kind of money, what kind of litigation are you looking at? Okay. For, uh, Treatment, as you can see, the most important thing that I'm trying to emphasize on you is especially the, uh, the neural tissue. So if you have neurocystic psychosis, that's the problem because many a time it causes acute clinical worsening and then triggers it a inflammatory response. And uh, treatment, so-called treatment that we have, of course, is not for the cyst. It is basically for the actual worms. So we have to look for the worms and treat them. And again, treatment is only targeted to people who show up clinical symptoms. The drug of choices are, again, albendazole, Quantil, and then again, sometimes we use adjunctive corticosteroid. Why would you use a corticosteroid in this case? Sorry? So why do we use that? What does that mean? Target information. Anti-inflammatory. Yeah, they are anti-inflammatory. Sometimes we have to decrease the immune response because remember, corticosteroids are anti-inflammatory. That's what you should know. So sometimes if the problem is more of an of a aberrant or exuberant immune response, you want to control it. So that's like an adjunct that we have. Uh, Non-pharmacological treatment, again, is only uh, very academic. I don't want you to spend much of your mental energy on that because many times it's a like clinical thing. Uh, in terms of ectoparasites, uh, lice are important and we do see, and also remember, don't teach it, but CDC does consider, con consider as lice infestation to be an STI. CDC does consider that. There are three species that we see, especially the uh, pediculosis one, right, that caused head louse, body louse, and crab louse. Crab louse is the one that is more found in, um, in uh, STIs where, because they tend to infect the pubic area. So this lice infestation causing uh, the problem, again, is very common worldwide. And uh, pe people can detect it by a small size. But most of the time, uh, it is associated with poor personal hygiene. And then again, uh, it can be passed through, as I said earlier, STI. It also remains a problem in terms of school, but uh, you can see you can get so much, especially for the kids. I think moms are used to it. They want to make sure that they can spot the actual light, but not the eggs, because eggs are there buried by the, by the uh, here, uh, bats. But these are like, sometimes even in adult, they confuse it like a dandruff. But it's not dandruff, it's just lice. So you can imagine people shedding lice here and there everywhere. But these are the sizes of the lice that we normally see. And as you can see from their appearance, with all these tentacles they have, they're going to stick over. It's very difficult to remove. 
And if you have your kids going to the school and they bring it home and then everybody gets it. So that again, uh, even if you have the best of all the personal hygiene, because socially uh, you are dependent on other people as well, especially in home and environment. So that puts especially uh, teachers, moms, and so on and so forth, people who handle the kids at a higher risk that they need to be checked for. Okay, again, uh, life cycle, as I said earlier, uh, any of that nature shows you uh, STI, especially for the one that tends to uh, reside on pubic hair and tends to be kind of passed on through sexual activity. And uh, also keep in mind in this case, uh, over here, it says here. So the more hair you have, the more chances are that you are uh, especially not taking care of your hair. So you can pass it on to other people. But these are the different stages as the rice grows from egg to all the way full adult. So that does need the rigorous treatment and it's not going to go away. So you basically have to remove the lice and remove the eggs there. For clinical presentation, again, uh, well, uh, pulitis is like itching normally presented with people, especially teachers and moms, they notice it of all the people that the kids are continuously scratching their hair and they have to be tested for. And many a time there are swellings of the skin. The other problem is that once they scratch that area where lysis are biting them, then they, what will happen is that they will open an area by scratch, then um, cause secondary bacterial infection. So that's another thing that you normally see in terms of secondary bacterial infections. Uh, if you go to over the counter, I'm pretty sure you're going to be a part of advising. There are a lot of things, gadgets available. There are nets can be picked up by special comps and you know shampoos and whatnot. And uh, for non-pharmacological treatment, they, you have to sterilize bedding and clothing, hard wash, physically remove nails from here. People can do that. And as a matter of fact, they say that even the animals like monkeys have disabilities, so they kind of not pick on each other. So pharmacological, all those things are available. The goal is to kill lice and ova. And then there's a preferred treatment that we have available and uh, if nothing is going to take care of, then you have to make sure that you uh, go for the therapy. But of course, the most important thing as a goal of the therapy is to remove the uh, ova or kill the lice. Okay. Scabies. Scabies, again, uh, in terms of STI, is an STI, and it's caused by the itch mite, Sarcotis scabii, and you can see all these mice with those tentacles and kind of you know itchy things which are going to attach to the body. They can affect both humans and animals, so this means your pets may have it. So you can like pass it on, maybe like a zoonotic in terms of you either get from your pets or your pets getting from you, whichever. They are usually classically affecting interdigital, popliteal fold, scalp, wrist, and axillary fold, and scrotum. So these are some of the places where they tend to have more uh, problem. And then again, uh, they can be transmitted from skin to skin contact. Right. So that's another thing uh, that you need to do. Okay. Don't shake somebody's hand. Okay. Hey, can I look at your hand first before I shake it? Now, uh, again, uh, life cycle of it, and uh, you can see from here the, the objective for all these complicated life cycle is, again, you want to, and maybe last couple of times I'm going to say, make sure that you know which one is infected, which one is diagnostic, and you can see over here, hands and wrists and needles over here, here also involved, 
And then again, we go through a cycle and the target is basically to go each one of them separately. You have to have a drug that will uh, kind of pick it up right from the beginning or go till the end. So this is usually a challenge when we treat people for scabies. And there's a big market over there. I'm pretty sure that those who are working in, working in pharmacy stores, they know for sure and uh, very common uh, in terms of uh, certain population group. You can also look at the way they are presented in the perineal area at the back and on the front, frontal area. We're, most of the time, uh, the skin comes in contact during uh, sexual activity. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> very severe itching to such an extent they would not be able to uh, sleep. And when there's itching, you tend to scratch it. And when you scratch it, you excoriate the skin. So you open up the skin, you give opportunities, bacteria, and all those things to go in. So that's also keep in mind. And that again get, goes to the same concept that you will wonder that why people have more than one STI. So the person may be suffering from scabies and the skin or the mucous membrane or genitalia is being scratched. And on top of that, if those areas are open in skin and mucous membrane, and then you have all those risk factors there, that's how HIV, that's how gonorrhea, that how all these viruses go into to particles at the time of such an activity. Okay, and then you can look at the. Uh, I mean, interestingly, there are kind of pictures available because of uh, the microscopy that you have, and you want to go and look at those weird pictures that are coming up in terms of uh, their ability to attach. This is like bacteria, one of the uh, path pathogenic factor I used to tell you was attachment. So they have to attach, right? And then again, washing would remove it, but depends on how many washes you're gonna do. Okay, that's why here, our uh, skin is something that uh, needs to be taken care of. Uh, one of the things that we normally see if you were to take a magnifying lens, especially that's what this dermatologist would do, so what they see that there are burrows in the skin. So it kind of because of the might, the ability, it kind of goes move around like snow shovels. So it's going to go like you can see that under the microscope. And then if you scrape the skin, you can look at the mite on a wet mite. And then again, uh, treatment goal is eradicate infest infestation. And there are non pharmacological uh, ways of doing it. Most of the time is washing is washing with the hot uh, water. And I remember somebody was telling me, they say, hey, about washing the shoes. Well, they would say, well, you have to wash the shoes. So you, you can imagine how many shoes that we wear can be washed. If you even have any infestation with KB slice, or even for fungal infections. Uh, tropical presentation uh, agents are available. Oral drugs are also available if things go out of control. And many of times, uh, patients are more annoyed with this kind of itching and things of that nature. So that would make people miserable in terms of the resorting for a treatment in terms of they coming over and see physicians for that. So that's kind of important thing. Okay, I think that pretty much finishes this series of lectures. And I'm going to take questions if you do have any questions. And then uh, I have some.